Hello, my wonderful pen friends. It is a snowy, wet Sunday morning. I have my, uh, my Oscar the Grouch mug with uh, Slimy on one side and Oscar on the other. So my Oscar mug of some nice ginger tea. And I am excited to sit down and answer some questions and talk through some currently inked. So let's dive in. Uh, all right, starting off today, this first question comes from Nick in Manchester in the UK who says, for working on nibs, what loop magnification and style would you recommend? And is there a particular brand or price range for good quality without paying too much? Um, Nick, I'm not an expert on this at all, but that's never stopped me from offering an opinion. Uh, I use 40X and that is much higher magnification than most people use. I think most people use around a 20X. Um, I like the additional magnification. Um, and I, I used to have one of those eyeglass ones that would, you know, sit right here on your eye. I actually have stopped using that. I prefer instead the handheld unit, the one that kind of flips out. Um, and I like a lighted one because oftentimes when you're in pen shows or things like that, you need a little light to, even if you're not using it through the loop, but just a little light to help, you know, shed some light, no pun intended, on the situation. Because lighting in those hotel ballrooms is often pretty bad. Um, I... Uh, I'll put a link to the one that I use over in the show notes on penhabit.com. Um, but the reason I like the handheld one is because apparently the correct way to use a loop is to keep both eyes open rather than close one eye and use it. And I like the ability to, um, rather than trying to move a pen closer and further away from my eye, which I don't know, just seems like a recipe for disaster to me, um, <laughs> is, uh, I like the ability to really get in there and, and get the different angles and use the depth like the problem with the higher magnification loops is the depth of field where the, the nib is in focus is very narrow. So you really need to be able to have fine grain control over how close and far away the nib is from the, the uh, visual elements there. So I would, I prefer the handheld ones. Um, I like a lighted one. I like one, the compact ones because they're easier to travel with. And I generally go for some that you know, that feel a little bit more solid. I'm happy to pay a little extra for a better loop. You can spend a lot of money and I don't have a professional loop necessarily, but it works real well for what I do. So I'll link, head over to the show notes on penhabit.com. I will link to it over there. Okay, well, let us go ahead and kick off the first currently inked. I figure I got a question that was like, the people demand to see your nebulosa. So here it is. I actually have it inked right now. This is the Aurora 88 Nebulosa. It is such a gorgeous pen. I just, I love this pen. Uh, rose gold finish, medium. This is number 516 of 888. Uh, this is my favorite Aurora by a pretty substantial margin. Uh, just love the pen. It's a nice wet medium. Um, it's an 18 karat nib, which is a little bit smoother than the 14 karat nibs I've gotten from Aurora. But I have it inked up with Lamy, I, I say deep lilac here, it's actually dark lilac, the, the infamous, famous, whatever, uh, Lamy, much sought after Lamy dark lilac. I have a bottle and a half of this and I like it. And you can probably see some of the gold sheen right here uh, in, in this light. Beautiful ink, matches the pen really, really nicely. Um, I've said this before, but if you're looking, if you can't find the dark lilac and you're looking for a pretty good alternative, Cross Violet is a re pretty good alternative. Um, the new Cross Violet that came out a year, year and a half ago, it's, it's really quite a nice ink. Um, so yeah, I've got that inked right now. It's uh, my, my daily carry at the moment. I've got that and a couple of other pens that I'm carrying with me, but that's the one I go to most days. So my, my notes at work have been purple for the last couple of days. So like that pen a lot. All right, let's head back to questions and uh, hear from Michael Elliott in Chicago, who says, why is it so hard to find the right nib size? My Visconti mediums are more like broads. My Pelican mediums are more like broads. And my Mont Blanc is, is a medium as I wanted, but it is a small medium as a nibmeister told me. Then there are the Japanese nibs. Yeah, um, I think the reason it's so hard for consistency is that th there's two things. First of all, tolerances between a broad, a medium, and a small medium are in terms of like mechanical distances are minuscule. So it is very, very, very easy to go from a broad to a medium to a small medium with just a couple seconds on a grinding wheel. Um, it's, it's, you, have to, you have to be very, very careful. And this is not something that is done 
in an automated fashion most of the time. This is very much done and finished by hand. So you are dealing with the inconsistency of Nibmeisters and the inconsistency of time of day, light, how shaky their hands are. I mean, it's there's so much variation. Plus you have different um, ink flows. So Pelican, for instance, has a very wet ink flow on most of their nibs and they make their nibs in house. So not only are you, do you have different manufacturing processes and a different set of standards, but you've got a different ink flow on top of it. Visconti's nibs are very soft because they have, for some reason, I do not understand, gone with palladium uh, instead of gold. And so those very soft nibs often are very, very, very wet. It, it may be that your nib is ground to a medium, your Visconti nib is ground to a medium, but because it's wet, it, it's coming out as a broad. Uh, it could be that it was ground to a broad. It could be that the nib tines aren't as close together as they ought to be, and so it feels more like a broad. Um, the whole Japanese, I will say that I feel like the Japanese nib makers have, have really nailed the consistency. Like a medium is going to be pretty much the same within a brand. So a, all the platinum mediums are going to be pretty darn close to each other. Um, all the sailor mediums are going to be pretty darn close to each other. And the writing style, the feel of the nib on the paper is going to be very similar. But it is such an intricate process to adjust a nib. There are so few people who do it and do it well. And um, each nib manufacturer has a different definition. So there's there's just no standardization anywhere. That's, I think, what makes it difficult. The uh, that's also, in my opinion, what makes it interesting. Like if I wanted a pen that was going to write exactly the same, every pen I'd get, I'd just go buy a ballpoint from a bag in the, in the grocery store. Like I like the inconsistency and the personality of every pen. I, uh, I like that I have to search for it. I like that I have to find the right fit. It means a lot of experimentation. It means trying a lot of things you wouldn't. And it gets trickier when you don't have access to like a pen show or Nibmeisters, that sort of thing. But I don't know. I, I really like the being able to kind of forge a bond with a writing instrument or adjust it to your preferences, which is something you can't do with rollerballs and bowl points, really. And so that's one of the things that I think makes the fountain pen hobby really interesting. So thanks for the great question. Walter in Scotland sends in this question. He says, having watched your video since the start, I cannot remember your ever having mentioned blotting paper. To viewers of a certain age, myself included, to use a fountain pen without blotting paper to hand might be unimaginable. How do you manage without it? I actually have blotting paper, and but I most of the situation, writing situations I find myself in don't really require blotting paper. Um, so when I'm writing letters, I generally only write on one side of the paper. So if I need to, if the paper's wet, I just set it to the side and go over to the next page. I don't have to flip it over and start writing again. In those cases where I do use both sides of the paper, I will blot. But I don't like blotting very much because it takes away the personality of the ink. It, you know, it, it makes it quickly able to turn the page, but you lose some of the shading and the sheening that you get if you let the ink sit and dry on the paper. Likewise, with my work notes, uh, it's rare that I have to flip the page so fast and I don't care. Their work notes, they're, they're all going to get shredded anyway. So I don't really care if there's some marks on the other side of the paper. The only time I do use blotting paper is in when I journal or when I'm using a bound notebook, something like that, because I will want to flip the page and write on the back side, and I don't necessarily want to wait 45 seconds to a minute for that ink to dry. So I'll blot the last few lines and flip it over. I keep a, a sheet of blotting paper in my journal as kind of a bookmark. Um, I bought a pack of a 10 pack of blotting paper. I think it's J or band paper. Um, five years ago when I got into the fountain pen hobby and I'm still on the first sheet. I haven't even taken the second sheet out of the paper. I just don't use it that much. And it lasts me such a long time that you know, here I just use these dot pads. And so I don't care if something gets on the back side of the paper. So that's why you never see it in my videos. That's, I just don't use it that much. So not, nothing against it. It's just not something I, I feel the need for the way I use pens most of the time. Daniel in Japan asks, do converters have to be matched to pens? As in not using a particular converter in more than one pen of the same brand, of course. I recall reading this on the Fountain Pen Network at some point, but have no idea whether or not this is true. Should I worry about this or is it just being paranoid? 
I'm going to go with the being paranoid. Uh, so long as it fits on the pen and you do a good job of pen maintenance, I think you'll be okay. The, I think the concern might be if you don't do a good job of pen maintenance or if you have a, you know, a mold issue on one pen, you wouldn't necessarily want it to spread to the other pen. It's not a deal. It's not a thing. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, some converters might not fit as well. So like if you're using a standard international converter, the standard international converter that came with your Jin Hao might not fit as well on an Edison or vice versa. Um, because as much as they talk about being it, it being standard, manufacturing tolerances aren't that tight. So sometimes you may want to keep the pen, the converter with the pen, just because you'll get a better fit. Um, but for the most part, I don't do that. I mean, I, I do now, but for a long time I didn't. Normally when I clean a pen, I fill the converter up with water and then I set the pen nib tip down on paper towels and drain it out. And once I do that, I just put the barrel back on and, and put it in my case. I don't pull the converter out. But once upon a time, I used to pull the converter out and throw it in a drawer. Every time I inked up, I just go to the drawer, find one of the right type of converter and plug it in. So you're fine. If that's the way you want to do it, that's totally fine. But I wouldn't worry about it too much. All right, let's grab another currently inked, shall we? This one is a Diplomat. This is a Diplomat Excellence A+. Uh, it's different from the Excellence A in a couple of ways. It's got a spring-loaded clip here, and it's a screw on top rather than a pull-off top. Um, but the biggest difference is this finish. This is the, I believe it's the rhombus finish. I'm working on a full review of it now, so you'll find out all the details a little bit later. But it's a uh, really cool matte black finish with this inlaid silver metal. It feels like inlaid. It's probably just, you know, masked off, but uh, really lovely pen. It's got a fine nib and it's a little toothier than I've, exp I've ever seen from Diplomat nibs in the past. Not unpleasantly so, but uh, a little bit drier, a little bit toothier. Um, I've only used medium nibs in the past, so it may be that that's a, a thing about the fine nibs. But I have inked in this pen, an ink I haven't used in a long time, this Pelican Edelstein Aventurine. Really nice green. This is a little faded. It's not an accurate indication. The writing is a pretty accurate indication of what it looks like, but nice, bright, sunny green. Um, yeah, so I like that ink a lot. This next question comes from Ritz Sert in the Netherlands, who says, could you please spend a little bit of your on-camera time to speculate or freely associate which aspects of the fountain pen thing definitely need a revolution slash evolution? Which components, in your opinion, need update? Do we need newer, cheaper forms of specialty nibs? Do we need for designers to drastically improve the international cartridge? Do we need newer, inky liquids? Do we need more extreme, high-end, royal, limited edition of craftsman craftsmanship? Do we need perhaps retina screens curved with translucent lacquers allowing for augmented reality analog experiences? Do we need new nib cartridge systems allowing for more gradient calligraphy writing out of the nib? Or is the only thing we want back in time to the interbellum flex. And yes, please don't refer me to the fact for this last comment. Best regards. So frequently asked questions. If, if you have the question, why can't modern manufacturers recreate vintage flex? I have a, a long frequently asked questions post about that. So head over to penhabit.com to check it out. It's, it's an interesting thought, Ritzer. Um, so I have a couple of thoughts. I think there are some aspects of, of the, the modern fountain pen that need a revamp. Um, and this would be more of an evolution than a revolution. The biggest one for me is around the filling system and the feeds. At some point in the past, we got out of the habit of feeds with wider ink channels and ink reservoirs under the nib to these very highly manufactured, multiple fins, injected plastic. I feel like we need to revisit the way we do fountain pen feeds. Uh, we should not have as much problem with ink starvation as exists in modern pens. I've never had a vintage pen display ink starvation ever. Um, I, I have it, it's a very common issue on most, uh, on, on a lot of modern pens. I feel like, and the international standard converter needs a revisit as well, I think. Um, now, I am, have made no secret of the fact that I love the interchangeability of standard international, but I am willing to admit that there are some design flaws there. 
uh, that result in this ink starvation that I dislike so much. I don't necessarily think we need to go with toward the route of, of Sailor, for instance, with converters that are so flimsily made that they just leak everywhere, or Pilot with converters that are so over-engineered that they, um, it requires a degree in mechanical engineering to clean them properly. Uh, so I feel like there needs to be some work there, both in material science and in design. Um, we, need to, we need to improve the feeds pretty drastically. From a less a uh, technical standpoint, I feel like one area that I would like to see revolution in is design. A lot of the designs I'm seeing now are simply a new material of an old design. I want to see some innovation in terms of design. I want to see different shaped nibs. I want to see different writing characteristics. I want to see different forms of the pen. I don't want to see another flat top model and another cigar shaped model. And, oh, this time it's in celluloid or this time it's in oraloid or this time it's in ebonite. You know, it's like simply smack, slapping a different material onto a pen uh, is, not, is not really innovation. It's just, it's variation. And I would like to see a little more innovation in terms of the shape, in terms of the, the writing performance. You know, back back when fountain pens were the mainstay of the writing experience, you got things like the vacuumatic filler and you got things like, um, you know, the crescent filler. I don't necessarily want something that is as fiddly and difficult to deal with as those, but I, I feel like there ought to be a way that we could improve the filling process, the the, the consistency of performance, that sort of thing. So that's really where I would like to see a lot of focus placed. As for flexibility of nibs, eh, I know there are a lot of people out there who want us to return to the flexibility of vintage nibs. I just don't care that much. Um, you know, there are enough vintage nibs out there still, I think, that people, the people who want flex can find it. And there's some really good options. I did a video recently about FP nibs, semi-flex nibs, and I feel like that's a really good option for, for modern users who want flex nibs. And I'm sure people will play around with it. Um, I think probably where we will start to see the next big innovation in the pen industry is with 3D printing. I know there's already stuff coming out there. I've talked to some people who are working on plans for 3D printing of nibs in ceramic. Um, and I've already started seeing 3D printing of pen bodies. So I think there's going to be a lot as the material science around that improves and the, the accuracy and the, the functionality of 3D printing it continues to improve. I could see us moving to a world where you can basically design your pen yourself send it to a shop, have them print it and send it to you and, and it'll write exactly the way you want. Um, I, I, I'm looking forward to that. We've still got a ways to go before we get there, but I think in the hobbyist world, that's where the next big innovation is going to come from. Fotis Papadopoulos in Greece says, why are you selling fountain pens you really like, such as the Faber-Castell Loom, etc.? A couple reasons. Um, and it's not just things like the Faber-Castell Loom. I recently sold a Classic Pens LB5, my Classic Pens LM1, an Omos Green Arco. So with a lot of the pens, even though I really like them, they're not pens I use. And if I don't use it, I don't really want to keep it around. Um, so that's a big part of it for me. Another big, another big part of it is I kind of set a hard limit on the, the upper number of pens that I'm going to keep in my collection. It's 36. I have a, a pen box that holds 36 pens and I want that to be it for me. Instead of I've got a second pen box and then a, a pen tool chest that has drawers in it with pens. I want to whittle down my collection. Uh, I, I want pens to go to the homes of people who are going to use them. And uh, I've got a lot of money tied up in my collection because when I started, I got really into, into the acquisition of pens and I've got a lot of money tied up. It doesn't do me any good to just sit there. I would rather use that money to go travel the world and have experiences and, and uh, you know, buy new clothes since I've, <laughs> since I've lost so much weight. I have to keep buying new clothes. So that's, um, that's why I sell them. 
I, I still, as much as I have enjoyed collecting pens, I still consider myself mainly a user of pens and pens ought to be used. I, that's just the way I feel about it. Pens ought to be used. And so I want to make sure my pens go to places where they're going to be used. The final question for this episode comes from Sarah in North Carolina, who, who says, I've spent at least $750 on pens and ink in my first year of being an enthusiast. That number seems crazy for an innocent hobby, yet my most expensive pen is a $65 Twisby. More crazily, I leapt on an opportunity for my short-term dream pen because life is short. I was sick of buying lots of inexpensive pens while lusting for a gold nib. So I spent about $300 on a gold nibbed dream pen, which was a good economic deal. However, now that it's in the mail on its way to me, I'm more afraid that I'll be afraid to use it. I'm genuinely intimidated by it now. It was an impulsive buy, but one I'd make at any time considering how hard I'd been dreaming of this exact pen. How do you deal with jitters when anticipating a pen you couldn't necessarily afford to replace if you lost or damaged it? So what I will tell you, Sarah, is... Well, first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a little bit of a proviso. As much as I like acquiring things and I have a, a desire for fancy things, I've talked about this a lot in my videos, I don't imbue those things with a lot of emotional meaning. I like the acquisition and I like the having, but I don't, it doesn't mean a lot to me beyond that. Some could say that's wise. Some could say it's not. I'm not going to make a judgment one way or the other, but that's, that's my take on it. Part of the thing you have to keep in mind is if you are into this hobby because you want to collect things you're not going to be able to get again, or you're, you know, you, you've, you, you want specific things and they mean a lot to you, it may be that using those items is not the right thing. Because it, by using, you're going to wear down, you're going to wear out, you may lose, you may have stolen those items. And if you, if you attach emotional desire or fulfillment to those items, you're going to, it, it will, it could very easily stress you to the point where you're like, I don't even want to bother. Um, it's a pen. It's not a child. It's not necessarily a memory, you know, the, and I've talked a little bit about this before, but I'll, I'll go get on my soapbox again to, to wind up the episode. My grandmother passed away a couple years ago and she was a hoarder, uh, lived in the same house for 65 years. Uh, when her parents died, she took all of the stuff from their house and barn and moved it into her house. When my grandfather's parents died, they did the same thing. When my grandfather's aunt and uncle, who were childless, died, they did the same thing. So when my grandmother died, there was a house that had been lived in for 65 years, a gigantic four-car garage, and four households worth of stuff. It took us weeks, literally weeks. We went through four or five 20 cubic yard dumpsters emptying out that house. There were bags of pine cones and ten, number 10 cans of gravel, thousands upon thousands of golf balls my grandfather had picked up at the at golf course when he was, he had one of those little reachers and would reach into water traps and grab golf balls. There were every Valentine card that my mother had gotten, every report card, every Halloween costume, every decoration from every holiday ever. And we ended up getting in so many fights and feeling so resentful. My grandma was a, my grandmother was a collector of glassware. Um, so, you know, figurines and salt and pepper shakers and carnival glass and plates and blah, 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 blah. I mean, it, it was literally weeks and weeks of our lives cleaning that house out. We felt so resentful about it that by the time it was done, like even still two years later, when I think of my grandma, I don't think of the good times we had. I think of how, how she could have left us with such a mess, you know, how she was able to not think about what she was leaving us. And we threw away so much stuff. But to my grandmother, that stuff was tied to meaning. So 
a good example of this, about four or five months before she died, I was in Ohio. My mom was there. I was helping my mom. We were going to start cleaning out the house. It took us all of a long weekend to do one room. Um, and that wasn't throwing much away. That was just kind of stacking it in piles to be thrown away later because we didn't have a dumpster yet. At one point, we were at, my, at the nursing home with my grandmother, and she said, can you go up in your grandfather's room behind the door? There's a stack of clothes, and about two-thirds of the way down, there's a pink sweater. And under that pink sweater, there's this, um, I don't know, it was a hat or a, I don't even remember what the item was, but she wanted that one particular item. She's like, that was the thing that your grandfather got me when, uh, when we had our 30th anniversary or something like that. Well, we had already thrown it away. It meant nothing to us. But my grandmother had tied all of her memories to individual items. She didn't tell us any of those those memories. We didn't know what any of this stuff meant. But literally everything in that house, every can of gravel, every pine cone, every golf ball meant something to her. And so what, what I learned from that experience and what has kind of changed my perspective is that Memories, things are not memories. Things can trigger memories, but the thing themselves is not the memory. The memories are what's important. So if you are ascribing value to this pen above and beyond the dollar value, maybe write down what it means. Maybe take some photos of it. Maybe Maybe write a, a really cool journal entry about what it meant to you to buy this first gold nibbed fountain pen. And then the memory is there. The memory is never going away. You'll have that forever. Even if you lose the pen, the memory is still there. And you can jog it by looking at the photos or jog it by, by reading that, that blog post. If you, can, if you can separate the emotional value from the physical object, you will be a lot happier because you don't have to worry about that pen getting lost or damaged or stolen. So that's how I deal with it. And this got a little bit more serious perhaps than I intended, but, but I have really become, as much as I love to buy things and love to spend money, I've really become a proponent of let the memories be the memories, let the experience be the important thing, not the object that's tied to it. And it gives you a lot of freedom of flexibility that if you tie the memory or the experience or the emotional meaning to the object, you don't have anymore because all of a sudden the object itself becomes precious. So hopefully that will give you a little bit of direction. My overhead camera stopped, which is probably good, good, good sign that I need to stop too. It looks like I've been at it for about 30 minutes. So uh, I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Currently Inked. I have really enjoyed doing it. My tea's getting cold. So I'm going to uh, go reheat it a little bit, a little bit of ginger tea, and uh, enjoy the rest of my Sunday afternoon. I'm going to go, speaking of buying things, I'm going to go buy myself a new dining room table and uh, pick out some hardware. I'm, I've, I've lived in this house for four years and still haven't put knobs on the, the, the cabinet doors or pulls on the drawers, so I'm, I'm going to go do that. Uh, go, go find out which ones I want and, and start putting the order to get all of those things. So... Uh, hopefully we'll see you here soon on another episode of Currently Inked. Have a good one. Take care and bye. All right. Let's grab another question or two before we wrap up this episode. Oh, I've got, I've got dog hair all over me, don't I? Yes, I do. That's what I get for rolling around on the floor with the dog before recording a video. Where's my, uh, my lint roller? I've got, usually got them all over the house, but for some reason I forgot to bring one in here with me. Well, if you're watching and, and judging silently or not so silently, um, I'm aware of the issue. All right. <laughs>